I think God has a bad reputation. And people are so afraid to use the word God that almost everybody and their dog now uses the word universe. Well, the universe will show me the way and I'm just going to let the universe work through me. You know, the universe will guide me. I actually said to somebody once when they said that, the word universe, when I look in Webster's, I think it defines it as the entire solar system, galaxy, and planets, and, you know, black holes that are all around us. So when you're saying the universe will guide you, are you saying that Pluto meets with Saturn and Uranus to talk about your life and where it's going? A question asked courageously, answered honestly, and lived authentically can change your whole life. For me, that question was, how can I use what I have, what I love, and what I know to bless the lives of others? The School for Good Living and this podcast are one answer to that question. Hi, I'm Brian Miller. I know that the world can work for everyone, but that it won't until it works for you. I've created this to help you make the difference you were born to make. It's a series of conversations with thought leaders who are moving humanity forward. And in each episode, I explore their lives and the work they do. I also ask them to break down how they've gotten their books written, published, and read. This podcast is all about exploring the magic and mystery, and sometimes the misery, of the creative process. So if you have a mission, a message, and the motivation to share it, this podcast is for you. Welcome to the School for Good Living. Hello, my friends. Today, my guest is Don Dapani, D-A-N-D-A-P-A-N-I. Don Dapani is a Hindu priest, an entrepreneur, a former monk of 10 years. He graduated, what else would you do when you leave a cloistered monastery after a decade, with a degree in electrical engineering. After his vows expired, he moved to New York City. He helps people live lives of purpose and joy by empowering them with tools and teachings that have been used by Hindu monks of his tradition for thousands of years. No stranger to using technology to spread a message. Dandapani's TEDx talk has been viewed more than 3 million times. And get this, his Goldcast videos have been viewed more than 75 million times in just five months. So his message clearly is resonating with some people. His key product or message, unwavering focus, something that I think each of us could use more of. He's got a wonderful perspective on why we have such a hard time maintaining concentration, how we can do it more fully. He talks about how he ended up and why in that monastery, giving up essentially everything he owned, including relationships, chocolate, other stuff. We talk in this conversation about the difference between mindfulness and meditation and religion and God. We talk about the power of commitment. We talk about, of course, the power of concentration. He shares a project he has a 300 year plan for, a botanical garden and sanctuary he's building in Costa Rica. How far out are you thinking? He also shares toward the end of our conversation, I love his view of writing as a way of moving emotion. He also talks about making money, doing spiritual work. If that's something you do, you might find his view on that very useful. He talks about how he views promotion has some insights that have worked for him, and that might work for you as well. Dandapani has done work for many notable clients. His work takes him around the world. He's worked for Nike. These other companies aren't necessarily based here in the United States. Trivago, Commonwealth Bank of Australia, Fortress Investment Group. When I met Dandapani, I invited him to come speak to our group of entrepreneurs here in Salt Lake City. He did a fantastic job. I love a view Dandapani shares in this interview. A a brother monk, a fellow monk of his, once said, reason should not end where spirituality begins. Dandapani, welcome to the School for Good Living. Thank you. Thank you for having me on, Brian. Yeah. Will you tell me, please, what is life about? Uh, That's a very good question. I would say there are many different answers, obviously, to it. And the answer would really be based on the philosophy that you subscribe to. If you subscribe to a particular philosophy, you might give one particular type of answer. And if you subscribe to another philosophy, then you give a different answer. So as a Hindu and a practicing Hindu, the philosophy that I subscribe to says that life is about realizing that you are divinity. Through deep meditation and prayer and spiritual practices, 
and working on being a better version of yourself and improving yourself, you go deep within yourself to experience God within you. That's what life is about. But then, you know, obviously someone subscribing to a different philosophy might say life is about having a great party. Yeah. You know. I know people like that. I like to be invited to their parties. I just don't subscribe to their philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> Who yeah. doesn't like a good party? Yeah. Now, I remember once a professor of religion presented different models of religions. And one of the things that he suggested is that the religions of the desert, the, the Western religions, Judeo-Christian tend to believe God is up here and we're down here. Whereas the Eastern, and, and I remember he distinguished saying, there's a difference between the religions of revelation and the religions of release, where the Eastern traditions, general, generally speaking, believe like you're saying that divinity is within us. It's not above us or separate from us. It's actually inside us waiting to be expressed or realized. And I, I think that's a really beautiful perspective. Yeah, it's really interesting because you, you are right. As you, call, say, the, as you say, the Abrahamic religions, the religions of the desert, as you may say, believe that God's above us. The interesting thing, it's always funny for me, people, you know, when I hear people refer to God, the good God above us, right? You know, you, you see preachers and priests pointing their hand, finger to the sky, right? You see athletes do this too, you know, they score a goal, they put a basket and they look up in the sky and they thank God. So my question, if, if God is above us, you know, up there in the heavens, and if you happen to be in Oslo, Norway, and you're looking up in the sky and say, God's above there. You go like, okay, fair enough. And then what happens if you fly to uh, Christchurch, New Zealand, and you point above you? That's in the complete opposite direction <laughs> of Oslo, Norway. So where are you pointing to now? Because we are, I'm not a subscriber to the flat earth theory, you know, not sold on that one. So I believe we're, we're sitting on a ball flying yeah. through space. And whichever direction you point is is above. Yeah. So there's 360 degrees to point at. So I'm not quite sure where above is. It's not like I'm on the yeah. second floor of my apartment <laughs> in the building in New York and I point yeah. above as yes, God is on the third floor. Yeah. So no. I'm not sure when people, I'm not sure if people actually give it much thought when they point up in the sky and say God's above us. Yeah. Well, I think there's a lot of things in life that are just a lot easier or less painful if we don't think about them too deeply. <laughs> 100% agree. Yeah. Better not to think about it, just follow along. Yeah. It, it's like the movies, you know, if you think about it too much, like, you know, an action movie or something, you know, and then you just go like, oh, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. You see all these plot holes. Oh, you see all the plot holes, right? Everything yeah. has plot holes to it. I was watching a movie the other day and I was going like, wait a minute, how did that go from this to this? Don't think about it. You're here, they're here to entertain you, right? Yeah. And so, religion is not, not meant to be thought a lot about. So when someone asks you who you are and what you do, how do you typically answer that question? Not very well. <laughs> <laughs> You're not alone. Yeah, I, I say I'm a Hindu priest and an entrepreneur and a former monk of 10 years. And I now work as an advisor to entrepreneurs and some athletes, helping them with their mind and how to leverage their mind to be better at what they do. Wow. That, I know when you came to Salt Lake, and I'm really sorry I missed your, your program. Yeah, where were you? Yeah, I was in a meeting. I was in a meeting Obviously with my family. more important than yeah. my talk. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, I, I arranged, I extended an invitation to everyone listening to Dandapani to come speak to a group of entrepreneurs that I'm a part of here in Salt Lake. And the feedback, by the way, I don't know if it made its way to you, but was phenomenal. People oh, that I talked to. Who went there said that they got a ton of value and i believe you had some kind of material they were able to take with yeah. them and mm -hmm. so and and i understand the topic is the unwavering focus so just what you're saying you work with these athletes about is being able to focus to improve performance and clearly it's not just athletes and entrepreneurs who can benefit from this but will you speak about why have you devoted your life or a significant part of your life to this topic why is that important to you yeah i, I would say that you know, when I left the monastery 10 years ago and started to teach, one of the things I asked myself is, what would be the first, what would be the starting point? Where would I start? So I asked myself, what, what, what did my, where did my guru start when he trained me? You know, and it was really about understanding the mind. And if you don't understand the mind and you don't know how to control it and you don't know how to focus it, everything else becomes a challenge after that. 
it becomes a challenge to learn music. It learns it becomes a challenge to learn a sport and be good at it, become an entrepreneur, an artist, a scientist. How can you be good at something if you can't stay with it long enough to learn it, practice it, and excel at it? So, so just to jump in there for a moment, what I'm hearing you say is that concentration is something that we can develop. It's, it's, it's not just something some people have and some people don't. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. It's, it's something that everybody is told to do, but no one is taught how to do it. Right? I'm sure you were told to concentrate. Yeah, quite, quite a lot. When I was busy running around, like not paying attention. <laughs> Basically, yeah. I was too, a million times. You know, hey, Don Dapani, focus on this. Don Dapani, concentrate on that. But no one taught me how to do it. So once you learn it and you practice it, you can become really good at it. Yeah. And people aren't good at it it's because they practice distraction and they don't, don't learn concentration and they don't practice it. Yeah. I, someone that I really admire once suggested to me that if you look at anyone you consider successful, that they almost certainly have the ability to concentrate intensely and for a sustained period. And I was like, that's really interesting. And I started flipping through my memory banks of who do I consider successful. And sure enough, that's true. First and foremost for me, I look at my dad, who is a very successful entrepreneur, and he would do the thing where he would both close his eyes and focus, you know, at times. And he would even shut out distraction by asking people to be quiet or removing himself to a another location. I know we don't need to isolate ourselves to to learn focus and concentration, but what have you discovered? I mean, like you're saying, we're, we're told to concentrate, but we're not told how. Mm -hmm. And I realize this might not be like a simple answer, but how can we do it? You have to learn. You have to learn from someone who can teach you, right? And this, and you know, one of the biggest questions I get asked, Brian, when, when I'm on the road traveling and speaking, people come up to me and go like, is there one quick thing you can tell me on how I can learn to concentrate? Yeah, not like an Instagram post. Can you just <laughs> tell me in a story? Basically, right? Tell me in the story, 15 seconds, you know, that's all you get. It's like yeah. me going up to Beethoven and saying, hey, can you teach, is there one quick thing you can teach me about playing the piano? Yeah. I mean, what's he supposed to say, you know? I mean, what can he say that would so impact your life that you could play the piano? So for me, it's like, so that's why I've devoted my life, at least this part of my time now, to create a very detailed online course, which is in my app, mm -hmm. 10 chapters worth of lessons that people can go through to learn how to concentrate. Awesome. And, and very few people make it to the end because, I mean, you, you have to really want to learn how to concentrate. And I take a very slow approach, right? Because in today's world, it's all about you give the customer what they want. Yeah. Right? And if somebody wants to meditate, it's like, here, let me teach you how to meditate. But concentration comes before meditation. So I even have a meditation course, but you can't even get to the meditation course until you finish the concentration course. So a lot of times, you know, I get asked in podcasts and people will go like, oh, can you give my listeners a quick tip on how to concentrate? I'm like, no. <laughs> you want to learn? You're serious about it? Take the proper approach. It's like me yeah. going up to a civil engineer and say, can you give me a quick tip on how to build a bridge? Yeah. Like, no. You know, it takes you four years to get a civil engineering degree. It took me five years to get an engineering degree. There was no quick fix. Yeah. And I think people just become so lazy, right, Brian? Yeah. Like everybody's expecting instantaneous little tips and answers and fixes to that they think can solve their problem. And I just don't want to be part of that culture, you know, yeah. that, that are promising people that if I give you a quick tip, this will create a change in your life. Yeah. No, I... I admire that because I think it's not, there's not a shortcut. There's not a silver bullet in, in my experience. And I understand, I mean, you spent 10 years in a monastery. Yeah. Is that, is that right? Yeah. And, that, and I understand that you gave up everything, including relationships and things, at least put them on hold, which to me, I don't mean to demean your experience, but that, I mean, that sounds a bit like a cult. Like that's hardcore. Some... It's very hardcore. Yeah. It's a very, I mean, monasticism is an ancient practice, right? I mean, it's been around for thousands of years. There have been monks around, just like prostitution. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is like the second oldest profession. Or the something. second, well, second I would oldest. say the first and then the... probably, I don't know, I'm not sure which one came first, the chicken or the egg, but. But you, you went to, so you grew up in Australia, I grew right? Up in, yep. And you went to Hawaii for your 10 years in a monastery. Is that right? That's correct. Yep. Walk us through how, like, how does that happen? What, what's the, what's the, the, the storyline <laughs> that has a, a young man end up for 10 years in a cloistered monastery? Yeah, I met my guru and he 
his monastery was based in Hawaii, on the island of Kauai. So when I had wanted to be a monk since I was about four or five years old, and you know, ever since then it was really a quest to find a teacher that could train me. And, and when I met him, I found that he was the right teacher. What, what's his name? His name is Subra Munia Swami. Or Guru Deva, as we called him affectionately. Is he, is he still around? No, he passed away in 2001. Okay. Yeah, three years after I joined the monastery. Wow. Okay. So you met him. He came to Australia or you went to Hawaii yeah. or something? He came to Australia. I met him. We stayed in touch on email quite a bit. He invited me to come and stay with him in his monastery for a couple of weeks to see what it was like to get to know him and his monastic order and you know his way of teaching. How old were you at the time? Quite old. I think I was 22. What did your family think? Oh, I think they kind of always knew the back of the head. It's like, <laughs> you know, they probably didn't want to say anything. You know, it's like, you know, your son's gay, but you don't want to say it until he comes out and says it to you. <laughs> but, but it sounds you know, like your they were supportive. You know, yeah. Yeah, you're yeah, waiting your son's for him to monk. come out of the closet yeah. and tell you he's a monk. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they, were, they were good with it? They were supportive? Oh, they were fine, yeah. I mean, they never said to me, go and be a monk. Mm. But they never said, don't go either. It's hard, right? It's hard as a parent to let your child go. Yeah. That's the one that you drive, like it's up in the canyon. And then when you go in, I think there's a little, there's a, like a, I want to say a model of the planets in crystals. I don't. I yeah, 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 yeah. In the temple. Yeah, yeah. in the temple. I was like, yeah, yeah. that's really interesting. Yes. I remember of the, that. Of the, nine, of the nine planets, yep. That's really cool. What's that about? So for anyone listening, if you, and maybe you can describe, what is that thing? What is the temple? And then what is the model inside it? Yes, happy, happy to describe that. But just to finish your earlier question so that yeah. I can stay focused on, that, <laughs> on the topic. I would expect nothing less. Okay. Yeah, because, you know, I, I find in conversations, people go from one topic to another, to another, to another. And within the space of five minutes, you've gone to 50 different topics, none of yeah. which have ever come full circle to completion. Sure. And then you go like, what was the point of that? Yeah. So this is my job, right? It's, it's what I do. Yep, you're yeah. the guest. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm just trying to honor your question and, and answer it yeah, yeah, before we you. move on to the, to the next one. So the, the reason for going to the monastery was really about enlightenment, right? It was this philosophy I described said that divinity is within us. I wanted to experience that. I, I made the assumption that the monastic path was the most efficient way to enlightenment. Not the only way, the most efficient way, right? Where you could go, cloister yourself, and put your time in, in a place where it's built for that kind of experience or, or learning at least to have that experience. So that was the main impetus for going there. And then obviously the teacher, right? Having the right teacher is so critical and crucial. And there are many spiritual teachers out there. When I found my teacher or when we met, found each other, I just found that he was the right person to train me. I felt that he had all the characteristics of a teacher that I wanted to be a student for. And like you said, you know, I renounced everything, right? Relationships, family, friends, chocolate, ice cream, you know, going to the beach to give up. And if I was going to give up my life to go be in a monastery, then I wanted to be in a monastery where, with a teacher that I felt worthy to give my life to. What were some of those qualities that were that powerful for you to be willing to do that? I would say he was practical, first of all. Practical and outlined very clear steps to a clearly defined goal. And I think in a lot of times in spirituality, that does not happen. So I just finished five years of engineering school, right? And I graduated with a degree in electrical engineering. And, and one of the big things about engineering school is processes. That's all engineering is about is steps leading to a goal. You have a goal and then you figure out the steps to get there. You solve the problems along the way to get to the goal. Nobody argued with that in engineering school. Mm -hmm. You know, you never approach a problem without a process. So, but then when you take spiritual life or spirituality, there's no goal setting, there's no steps, just throw out the window, throw everything out the window, the universe will guide me, you know, there'll be a sign, a mysterious thing will come in my way. And yes, you know, everything in life is, has steps, putting on shoes, you put your socks, you put your shoes on, you tie your shoelaces, three steps. You never mix that up, right? Taking a shower has steps. Take your clothes off, get, you know, check the water temperature, you get wet. You never mix those steps up. You never walk in the shower with your clothes and put soap on your clothes, take your clothes off, put new clothes on, wipe yourself off, then leave. 
No, right? You follow the steps to get to goal. So why spirituality shouldn't have? Why shouldn't spirituality have that? And and he had that about him, right? He he was very simple. He was practical. He was goal oriented. And I think one of the biggest things that I also loved about him was that he placed the entire burden of responsibility on me. Mm. And and that's another thing that I find that a lot of spiritual teachers don't do is they promise their students that they're able to deliver something. And he was, no, I'll show you the tools. I'll show you the steps. Good luck. Yeah. If you get stuck, ask me, but I'm not going to do anything for you. And I love that, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's powerful. And as I hear you describe it, it's, I, I could, I, I mean, I'm thinking if you had asked me, describe all the qualities of a great coach, <laughs> they're those same things. Right. Because as soon as you lean on the coach, then you can't be great yourself. Right. You can't be a good student. You can't be a good teacher. Yeah. You know. Okay. So then when you were there for 10 years, how did you know it was, how did you know you were done? I didn't. My goal was to stay for life. And after he died, three years after I joined the monastery, he died. And, you know, I felt there was a big shift in the monastery, which was natural because he was such a, you know, he was the founder, such, you know, he was such a big part. He was all of our life of the monks who were there. And I stayed for seven more years and I felt, we weren't quite aligned anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to leave. My vows expired and I, I left. So, so that was, I was there for 10 years and then I left. It was a little over 10 years ago. Wow. Yeah. And the, and the round crystals. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Wow. And don't forget. <laughs> yeah, please. I'm, I've wondered that literally for years. Yeah, because yes. I understand there's this whole, you know, obviously this cosmology in Hinduism, every yes. religious tradition or philosophy has its own worldview. And, and I, I know there's something greater. I mean, I think we all know if we just take a moment and look above us or outside our window. And yet one thing that my experience is we're so focused on, you know, our immediate experience or what we have to do today that we don't think about the vastness of the universe in space or time. And I was really impressed by, there it was. And my memory is it was right in the middle of this temple yeah, it was, and every day it's rearranged if the planets are moving. So they, one of the monks move those round balls to different quadrants. Yeah, because they they are actually spheres that yeah. they are different sizes, which represent proportionately the size of the planets. Right. Right. And and what what's that about? Yeah. So in Hinduism, we believe in astrology. And, and that astrology is thousands of years old. Now, that's not something I know very much about or even am an expert at. I never quite grew up believing or practicing it. Do I believe in astrology now? I would say I believe it's true, but I don't. It's not something I consult to guide my life, right? Why do I believe there is validity in astrology? It's because the moon affects the ocean, right? And that's, we, most people would say yes to that. Yeah. And uh, how many percent of our body is water? 70, roughly. Roughly, right? right? Around yeah. there, a little bit more. So why wouldn't it affect us, right? Yeah, I think it would. It, it, logically, it would make sense, right? And, yeah. And, you know, doctors would tell you full moons, you get lots more crazies coming to the hospital, lots more accidents, you know? So the way I look at astrology, it's more like a weather, right? So if I'm going to go sailing... I would want to see if there was good wind blowing, you know, I don't know anything about sailing, good tides or whatever, right? The water's calm or whatever's needed for sailing. And if all the conditions are right, I'd have a good sailing day. If the conditions were not right, I could still go sailing, but it would be much harder to go about things. So in Hinduism, people consult astrology to see if the timing now is the best time to get something done. Or should I just wait another week and do it then? You could probably get things done at both times. One just requires a lot more effort. Mm -hmm. And another time, just things go smoothly. And you've probably experienced in your life as well, where some days things are just, you know, just happening. Yeah. In a day, you get 20 things done. Everything is flowing smoothly for like four or five days. And you go like, this is amazing. It's a piece yeah. of cake. I'm just getting things done. And then the next week, it's like, bang, crunch. Yeah. You know, you try to get one thing done, and it's just everything is not going the way you want it, and this and that. And so by consulting astrology and seeing how it refers to your own personal astrology, people have figured out the science of weather forecasting, so to speak. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I, th I think that's really interesting. And 
and one of the things that I think about with that is, you know, is it is it true? I don't know. Is it possibly true? Sure. And the history of, as far as I understand it, of the Western rational scientific tradition is the history of being wrong. <laughs> you know, the history of moving from ignorance to to knowledge, and in some cases, wisdom. But I think I think that's really really fascinating. So, okay. Well, thank you for satisfying my curiosity. What else is left to talk about in this part of the interview about your your work, your life? I mean, I mean, I know there's so much more. I would What's say the other big thing, you know, that I'm currently working on besides the courses and, you know, sharing people content through that is the project that I have in Costa Rica. Oh, yes. I'm so glad you mentioned this because I understand you're building a sanctuary and botanical garden with your wife. Yeah. So t- tell me about that. Yeah. So we have 33 acres of land. We're right on a river, um, maybe about seven, eight minutes from the beach. And we're creating a botanical garden and a spiritual sanctuary. So we, we have gardens. We've already planted maybe about 2,500 trees and plants, different types from medicinal to flowering to fruit trees. We have about 50 different types of fruit trees, not just fruit trees, but different types of fruit trees that we, we've put in the ground. And the gardens are broken up into seven smaller gardens, each representing a different area of the mind. So one thing about gardens is, you know, a good friend of mine who's a botanist shared this with me. He said that botanical gardens, the second most visited places in the world after the theme parks. Really? I don't know if you knew that. Even more than museums. Apparently so. Wow. People love going to botanical gardens. That's walking amazing. Around gardens. But, you know, I, and I've been to so many around the world, right, because it's something I'm passionate about. You go to a botanical garden, you see trees, you see plants, you enjoy them, but most people don't understand trees and plants, so they just, you know, it's flowering great, if not... They just have a nice experience in nature and they come home. What we're trying to do is that whenever, when a person goes through each of those seven gardens, they're learning a, a tool that they can then take home and apply in their life. So if Joe comes, and Joe's not even religious, maybe Joe's an atheist, you know, mm-hmm. but he just happens to be in town, hears mm-hmm. about the garden, goes to check it out. He can, as he goes to each garden, he can learn a tool that can help him with his mind how to work with the subconscious, how to get rid of past unresolved emotions, how to reprogram the subconscious, how to concentrate, how to develop willpower. So it's not only just a garden to display nature, but a garden to also educate people and empower people with simple tools that they can take back and apply in their life and create change. That sounds really beautiful on multiple levels. Yeah. And then for people that are more serious, you know, we'll offer retreats that really want to do the work and transform, work on, the, on themselves. That's great. So what do what will people need to do to make a reservation there? Yeah, well, we probably won't be open for another three years or so, I would say, wow. you know, two to three yeah. years before we start running retreats. And at the start, it will probably just be invite only just so that we can test the waters, yeah. run it, see how it's going. And then I would say, you know, there would probably be qualifications. We haven't really thought it out through thoroughly yet, but I would say definitely people would have to f- finish the unwavering focus course on the app. Yeah. What, because okay. that's the foundational things that I teach, right? And if you can't get the foundation, then... And I need to know you're committed as well. I don't want to waste time with people that are not committed. Yeah. What are you calling the place in Costa Rica? It's called Siva Ashram. S-I-V-A in the second word to ashram. Siva is ancient Sanskrit word for God. Uh, it literally means the auspicious one. Mm-hmm. And, and not meaning God above. Mm-hmm. Different to within. Yeah. And yeah, in well. everything, right? In the trees, the stones, in, in everything. That's Shiva. And ashram, the simplest way you could say it's a spiritual sanctuary. Mm. I love that. Well, let me let me go back and to the to the app as well because I heard you say that there's the meditation one, but before that is the concentration yeah. course. And, and what will you tell us? What are they called, and then how can people find them or sign up for them? Yeah, for sure. The the, the course on focus is called unwavering focus, and the course on meditation is called introduction to meditation. And the easiest way to find them is to go on the app store or the Play Store if you're an Android user. And just search for Dandapani, my name, D-A-N-D-A-P-A-N-I, and the app will come up and you can download the app for free. The courses you would need to buy, but there's also tons of free content on the app, talk, video talks, audio talks, daily quotes, a journal, morning and evening journal to help you with developing humility, selfless service, and gratitude. 
you Some know, I, key fundamental qualities. <laughs> I, I might sound like a judgmental jerk here, but I sometimes think that the people who might benefit most from that have no interest in signing up, <laughs> you know? Probably, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I set it up that way so that people can really benefit the most, right? And using technology to... Before I had the app, I had the courses on a WordPress site and people would have to download PDF worksheets, mm -hmm. check off exercises they're doing on the worksheet, evaluate themselves. And now we've just digitized that. And so people could, there's actually even a graph. It's a section where you can monitor your progress within the app that shows you how well you're developing your concentration, how well you're developing your willpower over a few weeks, a few months. And, and people know how to read chats. So if it's going up, it's good. If it's going down, not so good. Yeah, yeah <laughs> for sure. Well, and let me ask you this too. I know that in obviously, so in this conversation, we've talked about God, we've talked about spirituality. And as we both know, there are teachers of mindfulness or meditation that they don't make any mention. There's for them no connection between meditation and, and God or, or even spirituality and so forth. And, and so one of the things that I tend to try to be conscious of when I talk about this is for people that might be turned off by a spiritual aspect of it, but you know, to me, that's that's a shame that they might walk away from cultivating a mindfulness practice or meditation practice if they if they're turned off by that, what they might perceive as even a religious component. How do you think about that? If you do, yeah, no, I do. That's a really great question, and no one's asked me that, and I'm so happy that you've asked me that because I'd love to share my, what I think about this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. I think God has a bad reputation, and people are so afraid to use the word God, that almost everybody and their dog now uses the word universe. If you listen to people talk and people will say like, well, the universe will show me the way and, you know, well, if I'm just going to let the universe work through me, you know, the universe will guide me. I actually said to somebody once when they said that, I said, hang on a second, look, I, I, I was actually born in Malaysia and I spent my early childhood there and then I you know, moved to Australia. So even though I speak English, it's not... I'm not very strong in English, so help me understand some English words that I may not be clear about. The word universe, when I look in Webster's Dictionary or Oxford Dictionary, I think it defines it as the entire solar system, galaxy, and planets and, you know, black holes that are all around us. So when you're saying the universe will guide you, are you saying that Pluto meets with Saturn and Uranus to talk about your life and where it's going? I somehow doubt that. Yeah. So why don't you just use the word God? Why are you so afraid to use the word God? Because people are afraid to tie their meditation practice, their mindfulness practice, or whatever it is they're doing to any kind of religion. They want to be free of religion. They want to be independent, which then leads them to be extremely undisciplined and uncommitted. And as my guru would say, they're committed to being not committed mm. and therefore never make any progress. Or very little progress. Yeah. You have to find a path. You have to find a philosophy. You have to commit. You talked earlier about that man that told you, you know, the most successful people in the world are highly concentrated. Yeah. I'll add to what he said, and I said the most successful people in the world are committed to that path. Yeah. They're committed to going down that path, and they will not get off the path, and that's why they are where they are. And if you want to make progress in your spiritual path, in your spiritual life, you have to commit to the path. But you have the path is only defined by a goal, and that goal is defined by the philosophy you subscribe to. And I think people are so afraid to associate themselves with the religion, associate themselves with God, so they don't use the G word. I mean, look at you know Yoga Journal, for example, right? They've never used the H word. That doesn't surprise me. Hindu. Where does yoga come from? Yoga is not a Buddhist practice. No, that, that does surprise me. For one moment, I thought you were referring to the H word as hell. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Like Hindu word, right? The word Hindu. Yeah, that does surprise me. Yoga is not a Buddhist practice. Yoga is not a Christian practice. Yoga is not an Islamic practice or Judaic practice. It's a Hindu practice, right? Yeah. But yeah, you go to every yoga studio across the country, 
Homni Yoga says, oh, it's a Hindu practice. No, they go like, yoga, yoga is for everyone. It's just, it is just yoga. I'm like, what? It's like saying the Bible is not Christian or the Quran is not Islam. I mean, like, come on, give me a break. What's, why, why is it so hard to give credit where credit is due? If it yeah. came from there, say it came from there. So the way I understand that, like, I don't dispute that at all, that yoga originated from the Hindu tradition, yet my view of it today, at least the way I understand it today, is that people who practice yoga aren't necessarily practicing Hinduism. Is that, I mean, how do you see that? No, they're not practicing Hinduism, but they can acknowledge that yoga comes from Hinduism. Sure. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and I think that's important to distinguish because I do think that so many people, I mean, I actually happen to think, even though this is a generalization, that everyone could benefit from the practice of yoga, as far as I understand it. And yet I hear from time to time stories of, you know, maybe yoga is being introduced in a school, but parents will say, I don't want my kid learning yoga. They're Christian. <laughs> and they should, and they're right. And they're right. So you think kids who are Christian shouldn't learn yoga? Is that what you're saying? Absolutely not. Interesting. No, you should ask me why. Yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Dundapani, why is that? Why? Oh, thank you. I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> so I was doing a, a, once a year I do a retreat and I haven't done one in the last couple of years, but I take a group of people that have to apply and for this retreat and I take, you know, anywhere from 20 to 30 people and we go for a 10, 12 day, I call them spiritual adventures to Asia. And we spend classes every day. We go out, we have fun. We have a cultural experience, a spiritual journey. And once there was this lady from the middle of America and she applied for the trip and we have a little phone interview because I want to know who's coming with me. Mm -hmm. And she told me she was a Christian. I said, that's fine. I said, we have all kinds of people. I have atheists come in on my trip too. Mm -hmm. No problem with that. And she said, she's a practicing Christian. And we started to talk about the philosophy and stuff. And then I said, do you believe that God's above you or God is inside of you and everywhere? And she goes, no, I'm a Christian. I believe God's above us. God's in heaven. God's not in everything or everyone. God's not in me. And then, then I said to her, you know, when you come on my trip, you're going to be learning Hindu philosophy. I'm a Hindu priest. You know, you don't go with a Hindu priest to learn Christian philosophy, right? You're going to learn Hindu philosophy. You're going to learn about meditation. You're going to learn about concentration. You're going to learn about all these things. And all of these things are going to help you experience God inside of yourself, you know? But this is something you don't believe. And she said to me, you know, Dandapani, I've been doing yoga the last six months. And at the end of the yo in yoga, I lay down on my back and I close my eyes. And, you know, I do that Shavasana thing or whatever they say. And I, I feel this something inside of me deeper. And I said, you understand that's taking you away from your Christian beliefs, right? I said, if you want to be a good Christian and you want to follow your Christian philosophy, then you have to understand that God's in heaven. And if you refuse to accept that God's in everything, then you shouldn't do a practice that will lead you to that. I mean, is this not logical? It makes sense. If I fully believe that if I go to a neighborhood in New York City where I live, where there's unsavory people that do bad things, mm -hmm. if I hang out with them long enough, I'll do bad things too. So should I go hang out with them when in my goal in life is not to do bad things? I don't think so. Yeah. So... That's why, it, you know, Brian, I think what people need to do is they need to become crystal clear what the philosophy they subscribe to. And that's why I go back to the very first question you asked me, what is life about, right? And my answer was, well, it depends what philosophy you subscribe to. So when you subscribe to the philosophy and are crystal clear what the philosophy is, the philosophy defines the goal, the goal defines the path, and the path defines the practice. Four steps, philosophy, goal, path, and practice. When I practice this, I can stay on the path to get to this goal, which has been defined by that philosophy. But you don't want to practice something that puts you on a path to get you to a goal that you don't want to get to. You don't want to be practicing something 20 years later, find out God's inside of you and go like, crap, that's not what I wanted. I wanted to go to heaven. Right. You know? Yeah. It makes, I mean, it makes perfect sense what you're saying. I'm not saying they shouldn't practice, but I'm just trying to help them. Like I'm saying, I'm, gonna, I'm telling this lady that if you stay on this path, you're not going to find God in heaven. You're going to find God inside of you. Do you really want that? That's basically what I asked her. And she yeah. said, no. Then I said, stop doing it then. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and again, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm really fascinated by the paradoxes and contradictions that every one of us seems to live with, or at least the people I know. 
you know, that we're not aware of. And the first thing, and this is its own whole conversation, I acknowledge, but I wonder, you know, how many of these are, we just have this innate sense of, yes, I believe this, and I'm going to keep moving in a direction that feels intuitively right, you know, and then we come to a point where maybe that is no longer tenable and we have a breakdown or, you know, we've, we make some major life evolution but what this lady s- s- sound, says she what she was saying sounds very normal to me. And what I wonder is, did she end up going on the spiritual adventure? And if so, how did it turn out? No, she did not. I told her she shouldn't come because I, I don't want to be involved in taking her away from her faith and her beliefs. She goes religiously to the church. She yeah. believes in what her priest tells her. Mm. She's a staunch Christian. Why would I go and pull, take her away from something she wholeheartedly believes in? And that would not be right on me. As a Hindu, one of, not a, I wouldn't say our goals, as a Hindu, one of the practices we're encouraged to do is to support people in their faith. We don't proselytize. It's not part of Hinduism. So if someone's a Mormon, we tell them to be a great Mormon and help them to be a better Mormon. If someone's a Christian, we help them to be a better Christian. But it's not our job to stray them away from their path. If they're keen to learn about Hinduism, happy to share. But it's not my goal to go and fish them out of one path and Put them on another path. Yeah, I, I really like that. I, I, I appreciate that. And, and also the point you just made just now was that I, I think there's two parts, right? People are born, they grow up in a particular faith, and not everybody does, but some people do. And when they're growing up in that faith, their parents or relatives around them or their church or temple or synagogue could be indoctrinating them with certain principles and philosophies that they need to believe. You're five, six, seven years old, God's in heaven, this is right, this is wrong, you're going to hell, you're not going to hell, right? Mm-hmm. And, and that's what's put in your head for the 10, 15 years of your life. Then you start to become more independent as you're a teenager, you go to university, you start thinking more for yourself. A lot of these people abandon religion. Then they go like, you know, go out, party, do things. And then at some point they want to find some kind of stabilization. So they go to a yoga class, they go, feels, this feels good. I like yeah. the Zen, Buddhist, Tibet, Hindu, whatever thing is going on here. Then they start doing that. And then as soon as they start to get deeper into that, the first thing that comes up is all the programming that went into the subconscious mind when they were a kid. Now there's this great sense of guilt and contradicting information Mm -hmm. of one saying it should be this way, and and what they currently experience, which is telling them something completely different. Like that lady was experiencing something inside of her that felt deeper and spiritual. Right. Which is why, by the way, and why, even though I appreciate your perspective of not wanting to, you know, be the reason or the cause of her straying from her committed path is ultimately, you know, my view is that experience, there's no teacher like experience. 100% agree. Right. And so being one who is hearing what she's saying when she's inquiring about signing up for this spiritual adventure and, you know, you're checking in with her, which I think is totally understandable of why do you want to come and here's what to expect and all that. But and then allowing her to gain whatever experience she gains. And I suppose ultimately it's a choice for you as the facilitator and her as the participant. But to me, that that's the thing. It's like, man, some roads we just, we won't gain the experience until we go down them. <laughs> you know? Yeah, but here's the thing though, right? I mean, the that person needs to have enough of that experience over and over again till they become really strong in their belief that the experience they've been having inside of them is real. Yeah. Because at the initial stages, if, you, if I took her on the trip, she'd be fine the first few days. After about five or six days, she'll turn around and attack me. Yeah. Because I'm threatening, threatening everything she knows in her life. Yeah. So that's why a wise teacher, and I'm not saying a wise, I'm a wise teacher, would not do that. Yeah, that would makes let sense. her have that experience and have her build that experience over maybe the next 15, 20 years. And at one point she'll go like, you know what, I totally believe God's inside of me. And then she's truly ready to come. Yeah. She'll yeah. be back. <laughs> I'll be back. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Okay. Like the Terminator. <laughs> yeah. So with your permission, yeah. let's transition to the enlightening lightning round. Okay. Sure. Okay. So a series of 10 questions. I will ask them as briefly as possible. And for the most part, stay out of the way. You're welcome to answer as long as you want. But with that... Can I swipe left or right to get to the next one? (laughs) Yes. Okay. First question is a sentence completion. Please complete the following sentence with something other than, 
a box of chocolates. Life is like a... A great tool to improve yourself. Okay. Number two. I'm going to shamelessly borrow Peter Thiel's question. What significant truth do you believe that most people disagree with you on? That concentration is the fundamental first step towards any sort of change. Hmm. Okay, number three. If you were required every day for the rest of your life to wear a t-shirt with a slogan on it, or a phrase, or a saying, or a quote, or a quip, what would the shirt say? What my guru often said to the monks, life is meant to be lived joyously. Hmm. I like that. Okay, number four. What book have you gifted or recommended most often? Autobiography of a Yogi by Paramahansa Yogananda. That's the book that encouraged me to start meditating every single day. And that's the teacher who talked about concentration being an essential component of every successful person. Yeah, he's, he's, he's the real deal. Yeah. If you want a book that will change your life and put you on the spiritual path, read it. Yeah, I finished that book in Kauai, by the way. Did on, you? On the beach ah. in Kauai, yeah. On the 31st of December, probably six, seven years ago. That's amazing. Yeah, no, what, what a special book, huh? Yeah, really special. And then I did his whole, I'm still doing actually, his the lessons. courses by mail. Yeah, yeah. Love that. And this this bracelet right here is beads from that. The, the Self-Realization Fellowship. Yeah, in San Diego. Yeah. That's yeah. so and cool. And test, right? Yeah. Yeah. So tell me, I'll just probe on this question just for a moment. When you mention Autobiography of Yogi, I'm sometimes surprised both how many people know the book and what a profound effect it has had on certain people. And then I'm also sometimes surprised how many people have never heard of the book. So would you be willing to just spend a moment like explaining why is that the book that you have gifted or recommended most often? Well, I think he's also another spiritual teacher that's extremely practical. I mean, if you're doing the lessons, you see it's, it's not a wishy-washy, close your eyes, hold your hands up and feel the power of the universe coming into you kind of thing, you know? He has a very structured approach to things and he's very practical. So I, I feel, and, and another reason I've give, gifted that book to a lot of people, especially people who come from, what did you call it? The desert religions? Yeah. You know, the desert Reli religions. Yeah. Religions of the desert, yeah. Religions or the, or of the, the desert. Or, or the religions of revelation. Uh, okay. Religions as opposed of, to the religions of release. Okay. Okay. Religion, religions of revelation. Because a lot of the people from the religions of revelations who are kind of looking within themselves, that's a nice bridge, you know, because Paramahansa Yogananda talks about Hinduism and then he talks about Christianity a lot, obviously, but he looks at Christianity very differently than most Christians look at Christianity, right? He looks at it a very much more metaphysical, mystical way and finds a harmony between both. So for the people that are not ready to give up the Abrahamic religions and move to an Eastern religion, this is kind of a happy marriage of both. Yeah. And part of what I love about his work, by the way, is, uh, and I read them with my wife and she's a gardener. Oh, awesome. She's a master gardener and I love language. So I love that Yogananda is a poet yeah. and, and then she loves that he has all these references to flowers and, and plants and gardens. It's really neat. So no, that's fun. awesome. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Getting us back on track here. So question number five, you travel a lot and you've traveled a lot. What's one travel hack, meaning something you do or something you take with you when you travel to make your travel less painful or more enjoyable? On the plane or just on the road? I'd love to hear both, actually. And, and maybe there's things in booking, like I'd never thought of this until a guest said, I always make sure to reserve a hotel room away from the elevator and, you know, stuff like that. So maybe there's something that you do in the planning and the booking. Maybe there's something on the airplane. I would say for me, the biggest thing is jet lag, right? So, I, I mean, my travels are not domestic, so, I mean, they are a little bit domestic, but I fly to Europe, Africa, Middle East, Australia, Asia, a lot. So these are long haul travels. And for me, is wherever I land, I get into the time zone right away. So if I land in Sydney at 1 p.m., I am knackered, absolutely wasted, tired. I'll stay awake till 9 p.m. or 9.30 before I go to sleep. And if that requires me walking for five hours or whatever, I'll just do whatever it takes. And then I'll get into the rhythm. So I actually don't really suffer from jet lag. I, I can come home from Asia or anywhere and turn around within 24 hours and be back in the time zone. 
Yeah, and, and that that's helped me so much based on you know how much I travel. Yeah. Yeah. So so get into the time zone basically. Anything else that you found to be useful? Any any products or like items that you take with you that that you wouldn't want to travel without? No, not not really. I actually, you know, the one thing that I do is I have a whole routine, right? So when I get on the plane, I I have things in little bags, you know, like cables, whatever I need. If I'm going to be working, everything is in one bag, so that instead of pulling out 20 things from the bag that I need, I just pull out that one bag and it's got a USB cable, it's got a power cable for my computer, my laptop, headphones if I need, whatever. Everything is compartmentalized. So, and you know, if I'm doing long haul travel, you know, usually it's my business class, so you know, it's, I, I, I fly one airline, which is usually Emirates. I know what seat number I'm picking, you know, like what row, what seat, and I always get that row, that seat, because there's a reason for that. There's two com compartments on the side, which allows me to put all my stuff away. You know, on a 15-hour flight, that's super helpful. I have routine, I have a change of clothes. So yeah, for those long-haul flights, I, I plan out everything. Like, what time I actually get on the plane? Is it a night flight, a morning flight? You know, when I'm going to sleep on the plane, how long will I sleep on the plane so that when I land, I'm kind of getting into the time zone over there. How much I eat. People tend to eat all the time on the plane. I, I see this. It's crazy. Every time they come around with food, they say yes. I'm like, you don't have to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like being in a casino. They're, you don't know what time of day it is, and they just keep serving. <laughs> Yeah, they keep serving you food like every four hours. And I'm looking at people and going, like, you don't have to say yes, you can say no. You know, and for me, I'll, I might have one meal maybe in a 14 hour flight and a snack or something, but I don't, you don't need to eat three meals. You know, one thing that, and I'm curious if you do this when I heard you talk about your bag, because I do something similar with, I actually have a fanny pack and then I have all my cables and the pen and stuff. But awesome. one thing I've just I like added. It more now. Yeah, it's pack. camo. It's a camo one. Oh, uh, I love it. It's totally cool. That yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and one thing I've just added, my wife actually recommended this. Do you do the disinfectant wipes and you actually do the tray and the screen? And uh, my the wife does. I don't. Yeah, I started and yeah. I didn't get sick in 2019. That's awesome. Yeah, like that's so that's fantastic. Amazing. So, yeah, no, that's worth it. I hate getting sick. Man flu is the worst. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to plead ignorance on that one. What is uh -huh. the man flu? Sure. Just, <laughs> just, just, just okay. <laughs> All right, we're halfway through the enlightening lightning round. Number six. What's one thing you've started or stopped doing in order to live or age well? Ooh, in recent years or just in in life? I would say anything that was not that was consciously like, oh my goodness, I'm getting older. You know, what can I do to either slow or maybe even reverse that? But I would say it's open to you, any all time. Oh, that's a really tough one, huh? Because I think a lot of what my training was and my practice was, I think, helps with that. I, I would say the biggest thing is learning to control awareness in the mind. And I, I talk to people about how the mind and awareness are two different things. The mind doesn't move, but awareness moves within the mind. And the more you can control that awareness moving in the mind, you can more you can control where your energy is going in your life because my guru used to say where awareness goes, energy flows. And by controlling your awareness in your mind, you start to control how much you worry, how much you fear, how much anxiety you have, how much stress you have. And, and I think that helps you not eat so much. I think more than even the food you eat. You know, I think so much of it, I think everything starts in the mind first. And not saying the body is not important, the food you eat is not important, but your mind can literally wreck your body and wreck you. Wreck you. So by the more learning to control the mind, the, you know, the less you stress and worry and fear and, and are anxious about. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Number seven, and I love this with your very multicultural and your global experience. What's one thing you wish every American knew? that there's a world outside America. I'll give you an example, right? Here's a classic example. So I, I was born in Malaysia. I spent the early childhood there. I moved to Australia. I'm an Australian citizen. Moved, lived there for a while. Moved to Hawaii. Lived in Hawaii for 10 years. Now lived in New York for a little over 10 years. And then in a couple of years, we're moving to Costa Rica. So I, fair enough, I can say I moved around a little bit, right? And spent enough time places. I, I didn't know much about baseball until I came to America. 
and I still don't know much about baseball, but you know, you hear about it. When the Red Sox or one of those teams win the baseball tournament in America, Major League Baseball. That's right. Yeah, the World Series. When they win the World Series in Major League Baseball, that's right. Yes, it's called the World Series, and the Red Sox are now known as the World Champions. Do you see a flaw in that statement? Yeah, that they're based here. I mean, you have the Toronto Blue Jays, but other than that, it's an American. It's basically an American league. <laughs> so what's the flaw? That they're the world champions when they're only the, on the continent of North America. They're the North American champions. Yeah, I didn't see them playing the Hanshin Tigers in Tokyo. <laughs> or the Ugandan Panthers. Yeah, I don't think they were in the tournament. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. I don't even know if there's a team from Uganda. But have you seen the World Cup, soccer World Cup before? Yes. It takes about two and a half years for all the countries around the world to qualify to make the last 32, right? So all the countries in the world play each other based on, you know, so the CONCACAF region, that's the Europe region, Africa, Asia. They play each other and then from each of those regions, a few teams make the final 32, which then comes, which is then known as the World Cup. And that lasts 30 days, roughly. And then out of those 32 teams, one team becomes the world champion. So two and a half years where everybody all around the world plays each other. Then you, it's fair to say you're the world champion. How can you call yourself the world champions when you play in your own country? There's that logic again. <laughs> no, yeah, but yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's really logical to make. Little side note here, since we talk so much about spirituality and religion. There was a, there's a monk that lived in the monastery and he was... Uh, pretty good friend of mine, so to speak. We were brother monks for many years, and he had a beautiful saying. He said, reason should not end when where spirituality begins. Hmm. I like that. And I love that, right? Because a lot of times people abandon reason in the spiritual path or in religion. And why is it? Because in everything in life that you do, you're not unreasonable. You'd never stand in front of a moving train. Right. You wouldn't drink dirty water off the street. But then when it comes to spirituality and re religion, it seems like people would just abandon reason. Yeah, well, then they defer to authority. Yeah, or some blind belief. You know, someone could come up and say something, the most ridiculous thing to you, and you go like, yep, I agree. Like I had a, I had a Christian once say to me over a coffee table that I'm going to hell. And I said, okay, I, I think I knew that already. But uh, he said, you're going to go to hell and you're going to be eaten by worms for the rest of eternity. And I looked at him and I said, that's not possible. <clears throat> and he said, yes, it is. I said, I can tell you for a fact that's not possible. That's not going to happen. And he goes, oh, yes, it is. And then he leaned over and he looked at me and he says, do you know, he asked me, do you know how long eternity is? And then I looked at him and I said, let me tell you why that's not possible. And I, I was wearing long sleeves, and I rolled up my sleeves, and I said, look at me. I'm a skinny brown guy. If you put two maggots on me, they'll be done with my body in about a couple of years. Right? It's not going to take an eternity to eat me. So when you say I'm going to be eaten by worms for eternity, so are you saying that my body is regenerating flesh as the worms are eating? There's no reason here. If you said worms are going to eat me for 10 years till I'm down to my bones, I go like, okay, that might happen. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? Sure. So, so it's amazing how, I'm not saying that that couldn't happen, right? Don't get me wrong. It's a possibility. But what's not a possibility is that I'm going to be eaten for eternity. Because at some point, they're going to run out of flesh. So I think that's where, you know, in so much in spirituality and religion, people just abandon reason and start talking in terms, in ways that just don't make sense. Anyhow. Yeah. yeah, I think you're right. Okay, question eight. Okay, number eight. What's the most important or useful relationship advice you have ever heard and successfully applied? Yes, honey. <laughs> happy wife, happy life. <laughs> no, I was just joking. Even though I do use that one from time to time. I would say it's from my guru. And my guru, obviously I wasn't a monk then, but he would say this to other couples. He would say, I resolve your differences before you go to bed at night. Yeah, so... You know, whenever my wife and I have a misunderstanding or argument, we, we resolve it before we go to bed at night. All right. Thank you. And then number nine is, is about money. Aside from compound interest, what's the most important or most useful thing you've ever learned about money or what's something you're always sure to do with it or to never do with it? Hmm. 
a few questions in there. I, I would like to say I would never waste money. Sometimes I do spend it and then I think maybe that was not a good spend, mm -hmm. but it was never done with the intention to waste it. You know, you go to town and blow a thousand dollars and like, I don't know, cocaine and hookers or something. Yeah, we established early that you're not on the hedonistic life philosophy. Yes, so that's not going to happen. Uh, so wasting money. Second thing, you know, one, one of my mentors currently, a uh, wonderful man named Steve Hall, who's a dear friend and a mentor of mine, he taught me that profit is for the purpose of impact. And I really love that phrase. You know, profit is for the purpose of impact. And if you quote me, don't say that I said it, he said it. People always take things that my guru say and assign it to me, and I'm like, I didn't say that. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I love that view, and and I and I read something, and maybe this is in line with it as well, about the path that you're following of what in in the Hindu tradition is known as a householder. Yeah, is to earn a profit, is to earn money in so that you can use that in service to others. Is that will you, will you speak a little about that? Yeah, so the four goals on a householder path that is love, wealth, righteous action, and enlightenment. So one of the goals is to make as much money as possible. And the reason being is when you have wealth, you can look after your family, ensure you have food, housing, clothing, you know. And once that instinctive need is taken care of, right, and you know there's a meal coming for the next few months, then your mind is at ease, your body is at ease, and you can actually go within you. It's when you don't have that financial security that you're always thinking, how am I going to look after myself? How am I going to feed myself? And it's very hard to go within and be reflective and be meditating. So, and once you have enough money to look after your family and your loved ones, then all that access money, some of it can be spent for enjoying life, you know, like going to the movie or going on a nice holiday. There's nothing wrong with those things or buying a nice TV if you wanted to, right? And, and then use the rest of the money to create impact around the world. You know, for us, you know, for my wife and I, Siva Ashram in Costa Rica is, is where we're putting our money and with the purpose of creating an impact in the world. And, you know, we have a 300-year plan for that project. And the idea is that it lives well beyond us and continues to impact humanity long after we're dead. And, and we're using our financial resources to, to create this place that will continue to perpetually impact people's lives. I, I think that is so cool. Well, I, I'll ask this too, because I'm curious. Well, and, and I'll preface it by saying, I remember learning, and I don't know that this is true, but I did read his biography. And I remember learning that Henry Ford believed in reincarnation. And one of the things that I wondered when I read that was whether or not part of his, if that's true, that he believed that, was whether that influenced the work he did, not only to enrich himself or his family or whatever, and I'm only speculating at his motives, but part of what I wondered is if he ever had the notion that I'm going to come back somewhere sometime and I want to build technology that I will benefit from in my subsequent lives to continue growing and evolving as a being. And I wonder when I hear you say you have a 300 year plan, is any part of that have to do with coming back perhaps? Or is it just because you're concerned with, you know, service in the long term or something else? Yeah, I 100% believe in reincarnation, but the project is not about me coming back and, you know, benefiting and go like, oh, thank God I don't have to build this now. It's all here. <laughs> thank goodness I, I planted that mango tree. I did. My name, my initials are on there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, the, the idea is really for impact, right? Even though I believe in reincarnation, it's really about impact. And the question, you know, it's not about creating a legacy and a lot of times, you know, I, I I spend time with entrepreneurs and a lot of time entrepreneurs will say like, oh, what's your legacy? And, and for me, I feel like if I say it's my legacy, then it involves me. It's something I want to leave behind. The question better to ask is how can I serve, right? When I say how can I serve, then it has nothing to do with me, right? It's about me trying to create a difference on this planet to impact humanity, to impact environment. Whereas if it's a legacy, then you can say, this is Brian Miller's legacy. This is what he wanted to do. No, no, no. And, and then do you see the distinction between both of those? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not a legacy. It's, it's about service, right? Yeah. And that's really what the, the project is, is about. Awesome. All right. And final question. This question is, if people want to learn more from you or connect with you, what would you have them do? 
I would say the best thing to do right now since we launched the app three months ago is to download the app. It's, you know, again, like I said, you can get it from the Play Store and the App Store. Just search for Dandapani. Most people can't spell Dandapani, so you might want to put it in your description or let alone even say the name. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so just download the app and then, you know, there's access to a lot of free content, like I said, and then they can obviously buy a course. Uh, I mean, you can obviously go on the web and search around and find free content, but that's, you know, a little bit of a waste of time. And if you're really serious in studying, then I would say do my unwavering focus course. It's only $99. It's hardly anything. I mean, you know, people spend that on a dinner sometimes and you have lifetime access to it. And it's, you know, I put my heart and soul into creating that. And I would say that would be the most important thing I can teach you from my time in the monastery is in that course. That's fantastic. And I heard you say it might be a waste of time to look around online for free content. However, you might be being humble because I know your TED Talk is great. It's been viewed more than 3 million times. Yeah. And the videos that have been released through Goldcast have been viewed, my understanding is, like 75 million times? Yeah, I have two videos. Yeah, and they're up to 75 million or so. So obviously what you, what you have to say is being received well by people really resonating. And so people might also get a little taste of a little more in addition to listening to this interview by looking at some of that, but then also, of course, by downloading the apps that you've mentioned. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. Awesome. And, and a lot of the app also connects to a lot of the videos on YouTube. So we've actually pulled the videos into YouTube uh, from YouTube onto the app. So it's it's all in one place rather than having to go troll around YouTube and that's great. Get distracted by the five headed snake in Indonesia. Yeah. <laughs> and practice distraction, right? There. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. So the final part before we transition from the enlightening light around, I know we have just a few minutes left, but I did go online on kiva.org and I made a loan to a woman who is based in, I believe this woman is in Kazakhstan. I'm just going to double check, but she is an entrepreneur. She is in Kyrgyzstan. Her name is Nurzamal. She's 39 years old. She's married. She's going to use this money to buy cattle to increase her family's income from cattle breeding. So I uh, just wanted to thank you for giving me a reason to make that loan on your behalf. Is that what you do with your podcast? Yeah. So for each guest, I make a micro loan in their honor. Awesome. Thank you. That's very sweet. Yeah. Okay, so congratulations. You've survived the enlightening lightning round. <laughs> awesome. I did, badly. And maybe just take a few minutes. I, I'd love to continue just a little bit the topic on money and spirituality. Sure. Yeah, just because I think, you know, so many people have a weird relationship with money. For sure. And especially if they feel like they're on the spiritual path, then money is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Filthy lucre. Exactly. Right. Who are you calling for? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do think there's that idea of what do they say that money is the root of all evil. It's a common yeah. saying in Western tradition, but I've also heard it said that it's the love of money that's the root of all evil, not money. Money is just a tool. It's like electricity or fire. Yeah. And, and also, there's nothing wrong with loving money, right? I mean, it's how you spend it, isn't it? And what you use it for. I mean, if you use it to buy arms to kill people, then that's one thing. But what if you love making money and you love taking that money and helping humanity, giving a loan to a woman in Kazakhstan so that she can buy cattle? Is that love for money then bad? I don't think so. No, right? And somehow people think that buying material things for yourself is also unspiritual, which is a really weird thing. I mean, yeah, if you're buying 100 Ferraris, maybe that's a little bit much. You work hard and you want to buy one Ferrari, go ahead. Why shouldn't you have a nice material possession? Does that make you less spiritual? And I think people have such a warped perspective on, on money and spirituality. Yeah. And because their relationship with money is just so unclear. And I think when, when more clarity can reach, be reached on it, everything in this world, all the good things in this world is done using money. Often it just are fed, people are housed, looked after, aid is given, if there was no money, none of these things could be done. Oceans are being cleaned up. Yeah. And I mean, just on the other side of that as well, I think there's a lot of, I mean, I think a lot of what we've got ourselves into as a species is also from following a capitalist credo of maximize shareholder value, the exploitation of resources and people at all costs, 
you know, so clearly there's two sides, you know, to, to money, to, to, to everything. 100%, yeah. But so what do you say, because this is something I deal with in the, the coach training program I offer, which is, look, you can have all the coaching skills in the world, but if you are not willing, I mean, unless you want to walk a path my, like a renunciant or you want to do this pro bono for your whole life, which some people do, right? That, <laughs> Been there, done that. Yeah, that at some <laughs> point having these conversations with people about who you are, what's your professional identity, what's the value you offer, who do you serve, how do you charge, how much do you charge? Do you package or do hourly rate, this kind of thing. So this is all just kind of a setup to say, I've definitely seen this in the work I do, training coaches of helping them get past money blocks that they have. But what have you found that is helpful in helping people get past their reluctance to accept money for the service they offer others? Yeah, and I think the way to look at it, you know, it's something that my wife said to me very early on, you know, when I, after I left the monastery and, you know, I got to know her and, and I was just starting what I was doing. And she, one thing she said to me is look at money the same way you look at energy. You know, it's just an exchange, right? And in the old days, someone would offer a service and the other person might give them a bag of rice, which would feed their family, right? And I'll give you a cattle and you give me 20 bags of rice or whatever it may be. And, and it's just an exchange of energy. It's just a trade. It's not a bad thing. But I think the first step even getting there is that, you know, people have this block about accepting money or how much money for their services because they feel that money is, is a bad thing. They're not fully 100% comfortable with it. I don't look at money as a bad thing. I love making money. I love using the money to make a difference in the world, you know, and I love earning money and I have no problem charging people what I feel I need to be paid. Yeah. I, but, I'm I lo- to, but I don't look at it as a bad thing, right? Sure. I look at it as a beautiful thing. The more money I make, the more I impact humanity and the environment. Yeah. And, and then the more you're able to again. So it's again, like a, exactly. a virtuous it's a cycle. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. I, yeah. I love that. And, and I have this thing too where I love selling things. I just love it. You know? <laughs> I, I have to come learn from you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think it starts, and, and, and although I haven't heard you say this explicitly, I think what you're saying is in line with this is that when you view what you do as a service, you know, when you really when you really stand behind it. Now, I wouldn't feel good. I wouldn't love selling something that made people sick or that ultimately contributed to their unhappiness or, you know, their well, their, their adverse well-being. But when I believe in it and it's, then I, I especially love it. And especially if you know what you're doing is impacting people's lives, right? It's improving people's lives. It's going to make their lives better. Then why not? And you think, yeah. You know, it, it's it's interesting, you know, Brian, every now and then I'll get, like once a year I do an annual sale of my online course, and I just did that at the start of the year, and there'll be people posting on social media, go like, how can you sell spirituality, Medici- meditation should be free, and knowledge should be free, and I'm like, nothing in life should be free. If you ever expect anything to be free, that means you don't understand how things work, right? The programmers that built the app want to be paid so they can have pay rent, and feed their families and feed themselves, right? The guy that filmed my course wants to be paid so he can eat. Yeah, right? and, you, and you did, and you paid him. And I paid him. And right. the person that, you know, edited my talk wants to be paid. All these people along the way, Stripe that process the payment wants to be paid so they can pay their employees. I mean, it's a crazy chain of like people that need to be paid in order to put this one product out there. Yeah, no, I, so I totally see that. And my dad, you know, he passed about a decade ago, but before he died, people would say, hey, Larry, when are you going to give me free jazz tickets? You know, because our family owns the NBA Utah Jazz, the basketball team here in Salt Lake. Oh, okay. And his response sometimes would be, well, I'll give you free tickets when the players play for free. You know? Right. So, so just like you're saying, video guy wants to be paid, you know, this. Yeah. And we tried that other thing, communism, (laughs) you know, (laughs) from each his own, what is it, to each according to his need or something like that. And we saw how well that, well, I don't know, the Chinese are pulling it off interestingly with their amalgam of capitalistic communism. But anyway, that's not the, that's not the podcast I thought I was hosting. No, no, (laughs) that's that's a different different podcast. Well, if, if I know we're at our time, but if you're okay, I just want to ask two more questions, one about writing and one about promotion. Okay. Okay, so as I mentioned before, that usually this part in the conversation, I'll ask something about the creative process, something about writing. And I know you've spoken about this before. Well, actually, I now have three questions because one is, 
will you, or maybe you already have, write a book? I have. I've written a book, signed a contract with a book agent, and we're soon to take it to some publishers to hopefully get it published this year. Awesome. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I that know. was painful. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> For sure. So, so that was one. And then the next, yeah. the next question is about writing. Do you have a Do you have a title? Do you at least have a working title for it? Unwavering focus. I, I could have seen that coming. I love yeah. that. Okay. That's good. That's great. <laughs> Am I too focused? I don't think so. And then this question about writing. I mean, you can answer this however you want. But what have you learned about the power of writing that has served you? Well, I, I am not a good person to answer this question. Maybe you can speak just for a moment about the the connection between the writing and the subconscious. Ah, yes. A very clever man who pays attention uh, <laughs> to pre-podcast notes. <laughs> I think it's very useful, by the way. Yes. As you write, you well, there's so many things when it comes to that. So, you know, one thing that happens when you write is you're moving energy or emotion that's residing in your subconscious mind. And that emotion is moving from your subconscious through your conscious mind, through your hands, into the piece of paper. So I always tell people energy cannot be transferred. Energy cannot be created or destroyed, but it can be transferred or transformed from one thing to another. So one way to move energy out of you or emotion out of you is to write it on a piece of paper. Right? So a lot of times when you get a handwritten note, you feel the emotion that's gone into the piece of paper. Very different than sometimes an email you know, or, or handmade things where people put emotion into it. But, but writing allows you to move emotion from your subconscious into a piece of paper, into another element. And then the exercise I give for people to get rid of negative things is then you take the piece of paper and you burn it. It was an exercise that my guru taught us how to do to get rid of unresolved emotional experiences that, that are residing in your subconscious mind. I think that's really beautiful. And I, I have done that. And I would say from my experience, it works. But I would ask you, as the person that just uh, like shared that with everyone listening, does that really work? <laughs> it does. I've written hundreds and hundreds of pages, and I would say it's one of the most transformational things I've ever done. You know, the just a one-minute diversion to to take to have to experience divinity within yourself, which is where we started this whole conversation. You have to take your awareness from the conscious mind, where it functions most of the time, move it through the conscious mind through the subconscious into the superconscious area of the mind, which is the more refined, spiritual, creative area of the mind. But in order to get to the superconscious mind, you need to go through the subconscious. And if the subconscious is so filled with unresolved emotional things from the past, it can't get through that. And that's where most people get stuck, is in the subconscious mind. So this exercise of doing this helps to eradicate the subconscious of unresolved emotions, allowing that awareness to go through it into the superconscious area of the mind and experience more refined areas of the mind. I think that's so beautiful. I, I really love that. I don't know if you have this experience, but more and more I find myself, I feel like I maybe shouldn't say this, but like, I feel like I don't even, yeah, I'm, I'm going to just desist with this in the interest of time, <laughs> but, but I feel I'm not operating from the rational mind more and more. Yeah. And the superconscious is the more intuitive mind. Yeah. I'm just grateful for it with all this shit that used to just concern me. And, and like, literally it's almost like a dream state that I'm like, what was I going to do or say? And I don't remember, but it's not important. You know, being more fully in the present moment. I just, I'm really that's grateful. That's the beautiful thing that'll help you stay young. Yeah. You think so? <laughs> I think so. I think so many people age because of all the worries in their mind and the fears in their mind. Yeah. I think you're right. Yeah. That's that Mark Twain thing about I've suffered. I'm an old man. I've suffered many, what does he say, like many catastrophes, some of which have come to pass. <laughs> yeah. You know, something like that. Well, the last, the last question that I have in, is, and it almost doesn't feel appropriate to end on this after what you just shared that was so beautiful about this movement what would from I the buy conscious. With money? <laughs> no, it's about, promo <laughs> it's about promotion, uh, right? Because I know not every, every teacher or every coach or every thought leader or whatever, not every one of us is interested in promoting ourselves and, get, and creating an awareness and creating an interest and, you know, having people sign up or even pay, but some of us are. And I think a lot of people listening to this are. So my question on that topic is, what have you learned when it comes to promotion that has served you well? I would say, you know, promote yourself. Promote in such a way that 
it's authentic, promote in such a way that it's honest. Don't say things that, you know, are not true in the sense like, you know, by now the price is going up when the price is actually not going up. I mean, if the price is going up, then it's fair to say that. But don't, don't say things, you know, in your sales technique to, that are untrue. Don't also instill fear in people to make them buy, which a lot of people do, you know. Uh, that's, that's not cool. You know, just sell your product. Just share what it is it does the best you can and how it will impact their lives and be honest about it. And people want to buy it, great, and if they don't, they don't, you know. But if your product truly can impact their lives and you can share that message clearly, then people will buy it. And, and here's the other thing, and this mainly applies to women, and, and, and it's very sad for me to see this, is that you don't have to take your clothes off to sell something. You don't have to post a naked picture, of, you know, a picture of you in a bikini on Instagram for people to pay attention, you know. There's so many amazing women out there that keep their clothes on and impact the world, you know, in, in tremendous ways. So don't feel like you need to do that, you know. People don't want your body, they, they want, you know, what wisdom you have and what learnings you have and so they can improve themselves and I think it's, it's a very sad thing that so much of that, you see so much of that in today's world, you know, and, yeah, and then you see other women that, you know, create so much impact in the world without doing anything, you know, the girl Greta Thunberg, you know, 16 years old, right? She doesn't have to take a top off to have millions of people follow her and, you know, have millions of people come rally with her. What a what a great show of you know promoting something you know an idea. Yeah, it's amazing. By just being authentic and clear about it. Yeah, and being yeah and congruent and like you're saying, authentic is is really there. Well, Dandapani, this has been such a privilege. I have enjoyed our conversation so much. Thank you. Likewise, thank you, Brian. Despite living in an age where we have more comforts and conveniences than ever before, life isn't working for many people. Whether it's in the developed world, where we're dealing with depression, anxiety, addiction, divorce, jobs we hate, relationships that don't work, or people in the developing world who don't have access to clean water or sanitation or healthcare or education, or who live in conflict zones, there's a lot of people on the planet that life isn't working very well for. If you're one of those people, I invite you to connect with me at goodliving.com. I've created Life's Best Practices Breakthrough Coaching to help you navigate the transitions that we all go through. Whether you've just graduated school, you're going through a divorce, you just got married, you're headed into retirement, you're starting a business, you just lost your job, whatever it is you're facing, I've developed a 36-week course that you go through with me and a community of achievers and seekers who are committed to improving their own lives and the lives of others. So through this online program, you will have the opportunity to go deep into every area of your life, explore life's big questions, create answers for yourself in community, get clarity and accountability. If that's something you're interested to learn about, I invite you to contact me directly at brian at or by visiting goodliving.com.